Um, I want to welcome you to our Gallery 51 featured artist segment. And um, we have the pleasure of talking with Adriana Corral. And we've had several different opportunities to talk with you, but this is the first one we've had just you by yourself. So I'm yeah. excited to share this experience with folks. Um, so I want to thank you for that. I, you know, as I said, I have been really excited to just look at your work and see how much it relates to Hostile Terrain 94 and so many of the themes in your practice, um, specifically with regard to human rights, loss, memory. But one thing that I've always been most interested in with regard to art and art history is um, the erasure of historical narratives and the omissions and how we even acknowledge those um and what and and then how we how we think about the appropriate way of sharing those narratives in a way in which it's um it's not still considered peripheral like oh okay well we'll just put that in or we'll just or as everybody likes to describe it fill in the gap and it's so much more <laughs> than a gap because we see what your work shows so beautifully the connection of what still or what the what the remnants are, but then what the and unfortunately I, I have to call them consequences of those erasures are. Um, but I also feel like um, a lot of discussion this year has been around the idea of trauma and how we portray um, trauma within artwork and exhibitions specifically, uh, we're gonna do a talk specifically um, for, for black and brown artists and what that looks like in an institution um, whose history may attribute to some of those <laughs> emissions as well. So, um, but first I'm gonna start off with the question that I always ask all of our artists is tell us where you're talking to us from. I'm, I'm coming in from Houston, Texas. Okay. Yeah. You, you're originally from the area that you're in now? I'm from uh, originally El Paso, Texas, okay. so which okay. borders uh, Juarez, Chihuahua, Mexico, which is, oh. is, which is really like the, that's kind of uh, where the, I think the core of my practice stems from. Um, is, is this, even as a kid, this observation and the way that you um, so poignantly talk about erasure and erasure in reference to our historical narratives and consequences and trauma. Um, I think growing up along the US border, um, it really gave me an appreciation um, and I to to look a little bit deeper and see what are the dynamics between two neighboring countries, between two cu cultures, um, and really not just two cultures. That has um, been a, a, a place of passage for many, 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 many years of different nationalities from Chinese, Japanese, Lebanese. Um, and so I think it, it it um, very much opened my eyes to this diverse um, group of individuals of passing between this line of, of dividing countries. Um, however, they're still on the same landscape. Um, but it, it gave me more of an understanding of how economic trade happens, how a uh, justice system happens on either side. Um, what are the pros? What are the cons? What is safe? What is unsafe? Um, class structures and how they exist in our country. How do they exist in another country? Um, and so I think as a kid, I was always very observant. Um, but I think whether it was going back and forth to Juarez or um, even just you see the other side of, of what is from El Paso, even from the university that's there. Um, so just the in proxy too. Um, 
but it to me it's almost like a diptych they almost operate as this like diptych and they are so interconnected in so many ways but um i think uh it's it's really these kind of narratives that have stayed with me uh so heavily but i started to look just beyond the local then stemming over to the national and to the international conversations and realizing that these were not just um happening there in el paso but you know universally and um and and i think what always resonated with me initially is 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 things that i didn't know about or i couldn't understand um and wanting to understand more even if i come out on the other end with more questions at least i'm understanding the magnitude the complexity of how it is functioning in a dysfunctional way mm -hmm. um and so um yeah, I guess that could be like one way of, of kind of starting off the conversation in terms of where I'm from and um, and how that really informed enormously who I am. And I know it continues to inform who I am. And um, I mean, it's it's quite it's quite haunting and, and crazy, too, to think right now. El Paso, I think, is one of the I mean, among so many other, but I think it has even been reported um, that they're, they're experiencing such high numbers of COVID patients at the moment. Mm -hmm. And so um, I've been looking at past epidemics um, and, and kind of the language that has been built around either dehumanizing others of uh, contagious carriers of a disease and how the rhetoric really hasn't changed that much. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's also not only looking at erased narratives, but also patterns. Um, and, and the cyclicality of them and how I'm often working from a trace um, and sometimes leaving a trace behind. But I think what you're talking about also with the consequences and trauma um, there's a physician in California, Nadine Burke, who is really studying uh, the effects of trauma and what it has on children, uh, adults, and how that can also lead to other diseases. And she's, she's really fascinating. She's the first surgeon general in California. Um, but also, what does trauma do to the body? And so I think even though when you're looking at my installations, you might see them aesthetically very formally, but the amount of labor that goes into them, the, the amount of time, um, uh, there's, there's something also that I'm playing with the tension of that. Um, we don't often see always or acknowledge the labor, mm -hmm. right? Um, or if we're acknowledging the labor, um, who's it for? You know, and our, our history here in the U.S. has a very deeply, deeply rooted um, and difficult and challenging history with labor. And, um, and, and so, yeah, these are, these are kind of the, the topics that really sit with me and um, and, and the spaces that I'm hoping to create are, are in a sense, allowing this in-between moment of understanding and unpacking, um, all while tapping into your sensorial, uh, feelings, um, and, and looking to pain and loss and touch, um, and how can those be tethered out a little bit more? Um, but also how do we heal? Where is there reconciliation? What are those steps of acknowledging challenging subjects? Um, because really I'm, 
I think I, you know, when I was younger, I very, I think there were certain topics that I was interested in and I went in very quickly thinking, oh, I'm going to come in. I have a series of questions. I'm going to get them answered. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> and, and it was like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> You're going to come out the other end with a hundred more questions. <laughs> right, exactly. Which kind of circles back to what I was saying earlier, but um, yeah, so I think that's... Um, that's I think that's a perfect, it, it, it lays out the foundation because I think, you know, there's so many different things that you said that describe your work, but one of them was the complexity there is great complexity to your work. And I wonder, I feel that it, it is complex in a way that it is so layered and so extensive in terms of, I don't think people really realize, you know, when you talk about labor, you can see the physical labor in your work, but I don't know if everyone is acknowledging the um, research and the labor that you do for your work. We talked a little bit about it when we first met, but I wonder if you can share with us a little bit about your journey through archives and looking for these historical narratives, but also when you, what I'm interested in is when you do create these spaces, ultimately you've taken all of that, you've come up with this concept, you, you bring it to fruition, while I'm in that space, there's so many things that are going through my head. One of the things for me is you create, and I, I'm gonna use Requiem because that's what, you know, for here at, at Mass Mocha, but I wonder the complexity of your work. Do you, what do you consider is necessary or what do you think about when you think of viewers accessing that work? Because I'm sure there are certain things that you want them to take from it because there are so many different parts of it. So how does that, because you talked about different ways that you want the viewer to experience it, how does that work into the consideration of concept and then build out and the research that goes behind, you know, putting that all together for you? How does that? So work? we can, I can definitely say in hindsight, I can, <laughs> I can now, I can unpack it for you when I'm going <laughs> through it. It's a very uh, like kind of blind experience. It's like going down a rabbit hole and you're, you're just trying to navigate in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I might have mentioned this to you before is that I feel like I can equate my, my practice and the kind of environment I keep much like a, a greenhouse. And and there was early on when I was in graduate school, this really helped me. I had a professor, uh, Bailey Liu, who said to me, because I would come to her with these ideas and, and she would say, that's a great idea. And it's okay that it's not happening right now. It may happen later. And so just be patient with that. Um, but hold on to it, write it down and you keep it. And, and that, really helped me to kind of just like really sit with it a little bit easier because you know when you come up with something there's like this urgency of like I need to get it out mm -hmm. um but I think I can also even go much further back when I was younger and I was uh quite uh, avid and competitive tennis player mm -hmm. my father would not only emphasize on the physical, the physicality of playing tennis, but it was also a mental game. And so the mentality of it. And so my dad would buy me books on tennis, on strategy, and he's a huge researcher himself. And, um, and same with my mom, if you don't know it, you need to search for it and understand why. And so I feel like as a kid, I was often like with them, like, why, why, why? <laughs> Um, and so it was like, well, go look, <laughs> um, you know, and so when I was in, in, I would say in graduate school, well, even in undergrad, because um, I was really interested in, in disease infestation, 
primarily even cancer. Mm -hmm. um, I was focusing on that and how something so microscopic could be so destructive to the body mm -hmm. internally. And at the time I was also, um, my aunt had uh, breast cancer who was an anesthesiologist. And so I had also experienced these uh, operating rooms with her and my, my uncle and my mother. And it was very much like a family environment. And then it turned to her being the patient. And, and that um, kind of exploration of, of looking into diseases and trying to understand it I, I was creating works early on about the body and how does it break down internally. And then I started thinking, how does the body break down on it externally, like due to the environment or due to a, a justice system? Um, and it just started, the, and the thing is, I feel like I'm always listening to my work. It's almost like clay, you know, uh, or, or just how it talks back to me. And so I think what has happened with a lot of my works is that they've also built upon each other. And part of it, I am by myself in that exploratory phase of, you know, um, trying to understand to a certain level. But I think where the real magic starts to happen is when, um, say I might find a specific historian or a human rights attorney or an anthropologist, I, I find them and I'm like, I have to meet them. I need to talk to them. I need to learn what, what are they also uh, expanding on this topic. And so many times I reach out to them. Sometimes I never hear from that uh, person, but in the best case scenario, they respond back and, and then begins the conversation. And, and they oftentimes just share, um, an enormous amount of information that I'm just absorbing and absorbing and, and then coming back for more questions or having extended conversations. And many times it's based on what they've said, what um, their experiences are, and coupled with, you know, if I'm going to a specific site and I'm collecting either soil, paint chips, blueprints, um, and then it, it really starts with the individuals kind of, oh, you know, you should also check this out or I would look into this. And I think that's the beauty, the beautiful part about it is that they feel comfortable that they can share this information. I bring it to the studio and it's me just really combing through it very metic meticulously creating almost like a examination board on my wall and trying to find connections, trying to understand it in specific ways, but also because I'm creating installations and spaces, it's, it's also how, how can I start to unpack the body in the way that the body moves when, within a space. So then there's like another formal um, part of my research. So it's going to specific sites like memorials or monuments um, or even sites that um, might be heavily loaded with a history and that might now be a, a place to visit, you know, uh, for example, concentration camp. And so I go and I spend an incredible amount of time in these spaces and I'm watching how people navigate in these spaces. What is the body posture? What is their, how are they leaning forward? How are they stepping back? Are they careful where they're walking? Uh, what are kind of those movements of the body? And so then I come into the space and, you know, as I said, I have like this little greenhouse going. So there might be ideas already percolating and growing and I've been nurturing, but I can go in with a very regimented platform and like format of my template, like this is what I'm doing. But at the same time, I am also very organically led. And I think for me in my practice, it's important to have that balance. Um, 
because you just never know what kind of conversation you're going to have or where something might lead you to understanding something else. And so again, as the years have gone by and really my introduction to documents in the first place was based around the feminicidial work that I was um, creating and and it was Ariel Dulinsky, um, the human rights attorney who really shared with me like the power of documents. And, um, and then me expanding on that and looking at, well, what is the power of a document? What do they elicit? Um, what are they, when they're in a court system, who's privy to see them and who is not. And then I would take it even further. How do you even get to the courts if you have, you don't have the means or if you're being threatened, your family's being threatened or if it's intended to be, you know, buried and erased. And so I think, um, that was my introduction to it. And, and again, also to even the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That was another introduction to a document or a declaration that I had never heard about. Um, and, and so I think each of these things have allowed me to, to refine and learn the, my research skills and and then it would expand, you know, for example, I did a piece Unearthed Desenterrado, which is about the Bracero program. And that gave me the opportunity to actually go into the archives at the Smithsonian um, and in the um, Natural History Museum and really start to uh, dig in deep into the papers of Leonard Nadal and um, and then expand that into some of the other research that I mentioned earlier re regarding the delousing, kind of these delousing practices that were happening along the US-Mexico border. Um, and I would go to the National Archives. And so each place that I will go and do research or say archival research, they have their different ways of operating. I mean, for the most part, they have their a similar structure, but they also have their different way of operating. And I think, especially being at, um, at the Smithsonian and at the National Archives, realizing how important these kind of archival documents have now, because you know, if you go in, you know, you have to be registered, you have to have your code, you know, your uh, card um, to get you in, you have to have a background check, you have to have, you know, all these clearances, and then you can't go in with a backpack or anything, you have to go with a clear bag, you know, a pencil. And then once you're with these, these pieces, the way that you're handling them, you know, and then you have individuals walking by, making sure you're handling these mm. objects with such care. And so, you know, I think that there's a lot of care also in my work of the way that I'm handling things and the meticulousness on that, that you might not translate, you know, that, and that's like, part of the other layer that, you know, when we're talking about, there's so many layers within the work, it just gets, it's like compounded, but it's like so individually layered with, with different things. And it takes time and patience. And I, you know, I'm fortunate, like in the case of Requiem, I'm fortunate that I have a partner who I can, um, share ideas with, have conversations with, share readings with, uh, be critical with. And we know that it's trying to elevate the work, make it more clear in the way that we're trying to tell it, in the way that we want to tell it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so in, in the case like with Requiem, talk about something that very organically happened uh, Vincent started working, well, he did a drawing in two, 2012, 
a titled Requiem. And it was an exhibition where we actually first collaborated in. We did a separate piece that was based on um, all of the names of individuals who suffered from PTSD. Mm -hmm. And Requiem was also in the um, exhibition, the drawing. And he always wanted to realize that into 3D, uh, into a sculpture. And after, you know, you know, moving year by year, inching his way through it, it just very organically happened that we were like, you know what would be amazing if we could add this other layer to it. Um, and, and that's when, you know, we were considering the age of the American Republic. Um, even with Denise, it was just almost serendipitous the way that it all happened. And it was also exactly four years ago where you have like, you know, I remember being uh, the day after uh, number 45 was elected, Denise, Vincent and I were together and we had just done a studio visit and you know and then knowing this is the piece that we want to realize and it was still early on um but you know and the thing is one thing that vincent and i talk about too is the editing process you know as that's what happens in the studio for me there's a constant edit it's like writing i'm mm -hmm not an incredible writer by any means, but I know I, I need to just, there's constant editing happening with my writing. Mm -hmm. And it's like that with my work, there's a constant editing and of what kind of image, what kind of feeling am I trying to evoke? What, um, you know, lo even looking at the stages of grief and if somebody is walking into an installation how are you um, evoking some of those tensions or feelings? Um, in the case of Requiem, I mean, that was it. There was a lot of editing in just trying to realize the wall, you know, and, and the carving and finding the right material. Um, and also when there are perimeters, sometimes they can be based on budget. Sometimes they can be based on resources um, or what works within a space. What is communicating between, say, in Requiem's case, the eagle and the wall. Um, and so it's, it's really like not only researching the content or the individuals that we want to bring in to participate, then it's the research of the materials. What is working with this particular piece? Um, so that it operates in this specific way. So that's, that's kind of in a nutshell, like how these things start to develop and, and take shape. And it's a const, it's a constant conversation. Yeah. yeah. And, and I feel like that's how it is even to this day. There's the, I'm refining those tools. Um, but I, I have to say that individuals who have helped me to arrive to this point, I could not have done that without them enormously from the, the you know, the Lucy Rodriguez who embroidered the, the, the flag that I did or, um, you know, it, the whole crew at Mass Mocha who helped me to realize that wall and actually install it down to um, our, the mic, magic mic, the, <laughs> the uh, tape and float uh, guru, you know, and it's, I think it's all of those individuals that help to realize the work too. And there are definitely points where I'm by myself in it mm -hmm. and I'm combing through it and working it out. And then there's the moments where I, I like to be brought in with other individuals and continue the conversation and it be collaborative at different phases of the work. Right. Um, and, and I think that, I think, you know, that's kind of sometimes the challenge is that I'm also, not that I'm sitting here waiting for signs, but I think that's when I feel the magic in the work too. When there's these, um, 
either individuals or certain things may happen inadvertently, inadvertent surprises, that it's almost like the work is talking back to me and saying, okay, continue proceeding in this way. And so it's, a, it's really like this um, ebb and flow right. essentially yeah. that's happening. I, th I think the description was perfect because, you know, one of the reasons we do this series is to create some transparency. At an academic institution, there are a lot of young um, students who are aspiring to do what you do, what Vincent does, and I think that we hope that we can provide, again, some transparency to the, the process, but the I guess really you use this word, the magnitude of the investment to a project. But I love how you talked about the, um, I was gonna ask you that you have layered work based on previous work or ideas. And then that it's, it's a constant, it's constant. It's not, I'm done with this process or I'm done with this project, now there's a next. There is some through line to this um and there is a method to the madness you know yeah. there is something behind all of this and you alluded to that um that it develops and it does require a certain amount of um, mentorship collaboration negotiation networking um to make all of it happen i wonder for you when you because because the pursuit is so intense and there is so much of an investment of time and resources and all of that. What is it that motivates you most when you find the next, you know, to find the next project? Is it a pursuit of social justice? Is it a, you know, what is the thing that keeps you motivated along this marathon? I think there, these are just um, issues and topics that have sat with me since I was young. Um, mm. And really, they, they early on, like, they just really ignited a fire in my belly. And I think even through films um, or certain books, um, like the book, uh, A Mighty Heart by Mariam Pearl, and it was about Daniel Pearl, the journalist, and um, how he was kidnapped. And I think he was one of the first journalists um, beheaded. Um, but the way that Mariam Pearl wrote about it, and there's a film also that was created later, or the film A Constant Gardener, um, which I think these kind of films um, early on just there, they show the narration of uncovering um, these, whether it's a history or an event or an experience and bringing it to the forefront. And in doing something like that, what are the consequences of them doing it? Or what will it help to accomplish? Um, that kind of sacrifice or of, of how far are you willing to go to help others to either show, shine a light on these pressing issues um, that should be at the forefront of our knowledge. Mm -hmm. and, and I think reading books like that or, or watching films like that in that same kind of vein, um, that those were the ones that really, those were the, the kind of stories that I wanted to tell that um, if I didn't know about them, it felt like, well, how, how, how can we learn more about this, understand it more? Um, and I think that is also why I'm interested in working with people, not just within um, the art world, or in an art capacity, but expanding that into different disciplines or, you know, whether it's academics or attorneys or uh, community members or even the victim's families, like how, how can I weave, like you said earlier, that thread to connect these things through? And again, we can talk about this right now 
in hindsight because when I'm going through it, it is really like, well, am I going to get an email back? (laughs) Am I going to get a response back? Um, You know, and I think it also takes the belief of others saying like, I understand what you're trying to accomplish. I want to help you to move that needle forward a little bit more. Um, And to me, that's what becomes um, kind of the core of all of this is in order to have change, you can't expect one person to do something. It has to be a collective action. And that goes across the board, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think the thing that really opened my eyes to Ariel Delinsky, the human rights attorney, um, we had a conversation about even he feels like his hands can only, they stop at a certain point, you know? And to me, it's like, well, if somebody might have, you know, a certain limitation and somebody might have a limitation in another way and another in another way, if you're working collectively and you're covering different angles, you can, you can push that forward. And so that is really my, is also my intention of working with people outside of these things, because of course, in, you know, the dream way of things could, could I get policy to be changed? Ah, that would be the dream situation. Mm -hmm. But it's, um, how do you, how do you really start to work towards that? Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that that's always the challenge to me. How can, you know, I, I want the work to operate in a way that is, you're unpacking a history, a knowledge, um, or a historical narrative, or an event, or a trauma, and, and unpack it, and also mindful of your body within the space, and, and think about these things, but also think about them from a local to a national to a transnational perspective. But then, to me, the next step is, okay, where, and that's the challenge, is how can, how can that also implement some kind of, you know, change in another way, whether it's through a policy or through, um, you know, if it's a collection of artists, like we could look at Vincent, you know, you have Philip Gustin making work about the clan, he's making work, um, Gil Scott Heron, you know, and you're looking at three generations just right there. Mm-hmm. Continuing that conversation, I think it's, it's always to continue it because the second you stop, you know, it's losing that momentum. And it just, as long as it keeps pressing. But I'm always trying to, you know, and this is just me personally trying to figure out like how can, how can that needle also be moved even further, you know, in other ways. And that's, that's always the challenge, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and being, you know, really trying to figure out, even with students, I think what's incredible with students is, and even oftentimes working with them, those, that's our future. And, um, they're kind of like the little beacons of our hope and they're going to see things differently um, than, you know, the way that I do. And maybe it might be, you know, there's certain art historians that have just dropped a seedling on me and it was enough to set me on fire, you know, (laughs) Yeah, yeah. which is, which is exactly what happened with all of these delousing practices. I had an art historian, Natasha Goldman, um, and she just so poignantly, she knew my love of like history and World War II and um, kind of dehumanization practices to others. And she just dropped this seedling and it just, it ignited a fire. But then it was like, well, wait, how do I find this historian? And how do I find this information? And how do I? <laughs> right, and, right. And that was like, you know, almost 15 years ago that I've slowly been chipping away at it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, again, that's why I say sometimes we also have like, in some practices, there's like this immediacy, you know? Right. And I am not an immediate, 
read. <laughs> when, you're you're bringing me home. I'm I'm a I'm a novel to read with you. <laughs> this is not a magazine. <laughs> yeah, but I I think that you know um, that is that depth is what draws viewers to stick with you because you know that there's something beyond this you know that the that the story continues and i think you brought it back for me in terms of the complexity because afterward I, in my head and i think you alluded to this uh with the co the last conversation we had like that can't be it there's more we have you know there's more to this and because a lot again i think a lot of what you and vincent address are are constant they just look different over time experienced differently by different people and what you're illuminating again are some of the narratives that have um, been left out but are clearly still here so kind of putting the pieces together um, i wonder you know with all of this in your process, you talked a little bit about writing, but do you feel, I mean, with all that you gather, tell me, does this, I mean, you've got to, in some way, put this together and does that, is it in the form of writing? Is it something that you use as a means of getting to the installation work? Is it part of the work? Is it something you like to share or is it just for you? Or how does that play in? I think it's a little bit of all of that. Um, I think, um, sometimes it's like just these moment, these rushes of moments where I just have to like get to the writing and it's just letting it out. Um, and, and then some periods it's reflecting, reflecting in writing of either like what I've seen, what I've experienced or a uh, part of the process. And then sometimes it's writing to understand or ask more questions. And then there's another part of the writing that I think I'm still trying to formulate with this new body of work that I'm, I'm, still, I'm still trying to understand. And, and I think that, I think that's another part that is so important for us that sometimes we feel so urgent to, I need to understand it all right now. <laughs> and I need to get it out like quickly. And sometimes I, it's accepting, you need to just sit with it because it's not, it's also not easy subject matter to consume. It is, it is heavy, heavy information that is layered with understanding trauma, um, uh, abuses, um, really a whole structure and system. And, and how do you begin to understand that in so many different ways? And I think that's what, um, I think in one of our last conversations, even with Denise and Vincent, um, where I've also looked at the eugenics movement and understanding that and also realizing how they were able to um, kind of move forward in their way of thinking by placing people in positions of power. And I think that really illuminated things for me because if you have a whole structural system that is operating in a specific way and they can kind of pull like how how it can operate, um, that's how you keep a whole group of people marginalized. Um, and that was really illuminating for me as I've continued to even look at this, new, this newer research. And so when I say like, I'm doing the research too in the writing, I think it's trying to understand it from multiple perspectives, like, okay, if it was happening in the 1950s or, okay, then it was continuing to happen in the 40s and the 60s. Okay, and oh, it still hasn't stopped. 
Okay, like you said, the names change, but the forms stay the same. Um, and so it's understanding, it's me trying to understand what is the structure? How has it shifted? How have they tried to erase the old structure and relabel it? Um, and, and then it's also trying to keep up with, okay, well, did laws change? Did they not? Um, people who were exercising that power, are they still in power? Are they not? So it's like, these are all the things that are going in my writing and thinking and, um, and then going down dives of like, okay, so say for example, the delousing practicing practices that I'm looking at. Okay, so it's trying to understand like, well, how did even these kind of chemicals get started? Where, where was that? Um, and who was leading the way of that? Um, and so it's, it's looking at chemists, the history of chemistry. And so, and, that, and that's helping me to understand when I'm making also decisions in the studio, you know, because mm -hmm. it, it might be a, an aspect of that. And then it also might be like, okay, I'm also in the archives looking at newspaper articles, you know, a headline. So you have a chemist who might be creating this chemical right to allow somebody or to be used as a you know to rid lice and mites of but then you here you have then say something that very much connects to it but is somewhat not intended to be connected to you might have a group of women who are protesting that act along the border because they don't want to be sprayed with that because they don't know what it's doing to them. And so they're protesting it. And so here's a newspaper article saying, you know, these women are swarming like bees and they're causing havoc and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so I think it's looking at it from these multiple perspectives. And, and then again, writing about, well, what are those connections? Have those connections been intentionally erased? Um, or that, that history of it, or, you know, it's interesting to me that so quickly we want to point to Germany as, you know, using these kind of horrible, heinous crimes. But yet, you know, we forget how also you had a lot of G German eugenic scientists coming over and studying our methods. So, my mom says um, this like really great quote in Spanish, la zorra nunca ve, se ve su cola. The fox never sees his tail, essentially. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, it, and it's like, you know, you can't, you know, when it's happened, when you're doing it, <laughs> yeah. right. you know. And so I think it's like, um, it's in the way that we're even told, uh, you know, in schools about history or how it has a, a, a certain kind of perspective. And I think, you know, this writing started kind of really happening for me when I was in maybe middle school. It's like maybe a eighth or ninth grader around then. And I had a really good friend, Aaron Riblinger. And he, he was really, he was like, always like he's like he was so brilliant um and so I always looked up to him but he he would always read my writings and I think that was kind of the first of the you know I would always be questioning like educational systems like you know what are all these tests for why why do you everybody has a different way of learning some people learn visually, some people learn this way, some people, why are you forcing everyone to take a test? And I would write like essays about it to myself. <laughs> like, what is the meaning of this? <laughs> and I would share them with my friend Aaron and, and essentially, um, you know, expand on it. And he just would always encourage me, you have to keep writing those things and keep, you know, always do that. And I think, Forever, I just always held on to these uh, private essays to myself, 
of, of what I'm observing. And, but not necessarily knowing how to articulate it yet, you know, and, and I think I might have said this in our last conversation, but my aunt who I was talking about earlier, who was the anesthesiologist and um, passed away from breast cancer, she had also, when she was younger, she was a painter. And she had painted for my father, who was a huge, is a huge history buff, but she had painted the uh, 3rd of May by Francisco Goya. And so that hung in our house. And I really thought that she was the author of this painting, you know, the painter, you know, not the Francisco Goya. And so I think also having her paintings in our house, she never, I mean, between her and my father, the subject matter that they were interested in portraying was quite heavy, <laughs> right. you know? Right. And I, I think um, that just set forth like a, a tone for me of, of curiosity and wonder and understanding and how to, um, how, can, how can these complex topics, um, how can my installations um, invite viewers to think critically? How can these installations um, help you to unpack the magnitude of something through a sensorial lens? And, um, and also ask the questions that maybe we're not even asking ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in some installations, they're they're quiet, they, you have to walk around them. There's, there are these um, moments of you wanting to touch. And I, I equate touch to healing um, so much. Um, and, and I think that's also just something that I've seen within my own family, those who are physicians in, in my family, this action of touch and healing. Um, and how it's like actually reconnecting with um, the person or the story, uh, even if it's just a trace that you're working from. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I, as I think about that in terms of my own experience and then what you've described too, I think that your work definitely connects so many dots, but it's the idea that we did not know that these different dots existed. So you're a whole new landscape of sorts for us to look with, I think oftentimes more questions than answers, which is okay, because I think that reflects your work. But also um, I'm, I wish we had more time because I'm, I, my, ne our next conversation has to be about the choice of spaces, because I think that within the practice that you've described, there is a lot of decision making that goes into that. But there, I, I think there are probably a lot of different factors of which we are not aware or could even start to understand that impact the choices you make, that others make for you, that others may impose upon you. And I, I wonder a lot about that because again, I think that that is a through line of your practice that I'm sure there's so many different things that stem from those spaces for you and where and who and I, I could I could only begin to imagine, you know. Yeah. Dictates <laughs> what and why would you pick there? And that's not right. How can they decide this? But I want to have owner I mean, it must be immense. Oh, it is. And I, I think again it's like it's almost in building that team, you know, like to be honest, working with Denise is quite a, it was a, it's a dream because I think she understood my nuances. She understood my way of kind of working and gives me just that breathing room where I need to do what I need to do. But when I come in with the questions or I come in with, um, or if she comes in with, okay, well, these are the parameters, you know, this is what we can, what we can offer and this is what we can do. Um, and then there's the, there's me trying to just push that envelope a little bit further. Um, <laughs> even in the case of the burial plot that I wanted to realize, 
I have asked so many institutions and always gotten a no. And I try to take it as a not yet. <laughs> um, and then in, in the case of doing that at ArtPace, when they, allow, they allowed me to do it with the permission of a civil engineer, um, that was like a moment, that was a really big moment for me because it was like, okay, it's, things will take time, but you, it's like chipping away at it. Um, and, and not only that, I would, I would even couple all of what you said with, you know, how do we even get these installations realized financially? That's the other biggest thing. And in the case with the flag, um, unearthed desenterrado, again, like I got to work with a dream individual, Black Cube, Courtney Lane Stell. And Courtney has been running Black Cube um, for a while. And she also knew my, my practice well, how I operate. It was a le huge learning curve too. Um, how do you work with the city? How do you work with a historical site? Um, how do you get permission? And they were right on, in the middle of recognizing the Rio Vista farm, which was a former processing facility to the Bracero program. How they were, they were about to be um, recognized as a national landmark landmark by the uh, National Trust for Historic Preservation. And so it was, okay, so how can I get the opportunity to erect a flag in the middle of this space? Um, and knowing, again, this is a perfect example. I always wanted to do a flag piece, an enormous flag piece. I didn't know in what capacity or what would be the right uh, environment or uh, context, but I keep it with me. And when I first went to Rio Vista Farm and spending time in that space, I just knew immediately that it had to be a flag there. And, and where I talk about the serendipitous moments, well, when um, the Rio Vista Farm, the historians and, and um, Sayla Casper, who's at the National Trust for Historic Preservation, she's phenomenal but they gave me access to the blueprints. And lo and behold, where I wanted to put the flag, there was a flag. And so it, those are the serendipitous moments of, I think, um, that tell me, okay, where this is the space that you need to do this. And, and even down to, um, you know, Black Cube who funded it, they essentially said, We've been, we followed your work, we wanna help you realize this, and this is what we can offer to help you do this. And so, you know, again, it's like, okay, I'm gonna work within these perimeters. This is where we wanna be. This is what we're gonna do. I would love to do a catalog. And then I was able to partner with um, Andre LePage at Washington and Lee University. And she was able to do a catalog for this. And that partnership then took the flag to another level because we got to bring in the historians. We got to bring in an oral history of the Bracero a former bracero, um, and really talk about the work itself too. The woman who helped me to embroider it, Lucy Rodriguez, who so incredibly, like when we were working on the flag, she gave me clippings of, of, of some uh, of flag material. And she said, material seems to mean a lot to you. And I said, oh yes, it does. And uh, she said, well, most people probably don't know this, but I sewed most of the flags for the last inauguration. And it was like, does America know <laughs> that this Latina woman <laughs> sewed these flags, you know, like, and I think, so those are, I think these are the, the conversations and these are the moments that continue to ignite me in my belly you know, and, and carry the fire throughout the whole, the way that I'm navigating it. And, and also having a supportive partner that's like, I understand that you need to go and do these things, like trail on. Um, <laughs> but also knowing like, it's, it's again, it's like this ebb and flow that can be really challenging. And it is a hustle. Yeah. It is 
such a hustle. And I think with students, like, especially I think of them, even in the way that, because I'm teaching right now at RISD, like, and, and it was nice because even Vincent came and spoke to them. It's how, like, when your professors are no longer there anymore, it's you making that editing process. You have to keep the fire in the belly alive, you know? And so it's, it's also, I think I'm also always trying to look at my weaknesses, you know? And how can I improve them? How can they be, you know, how can I better them in different ways to continue making this work? Because it's a challenge on all fronts. I mean, I didn't, I didn't realize also coming out of school, I'm going to have to be writing as many, you know, grants and reaching out and applying to all of these things that, you know, I think I'm still yet to try to figure out, you know, I, with this new body of work, my next goal is how can I bring certain individuals together, essentially, even if it's like in a in a university, university setting, it's like a little research group to move this forward into um, knowing about these his historical narratives that are not in our history books. And granted, I'm looking at it from um, a visual lens, but it is still looking at so many parts of history. It's, it's making these connections and it's involving a scope of people. And so for me, it's how, how can I find the resources in order to, to now take that to the, the next level? You know, and so I think that's, it's always, again, it's like that push and pull and trying to, to, to work out those challenges. And sometimes, you know, understanding life comes in and you know you'll have interruptions and how do we work through those as right. artists um in this case how do you work through a pandemic you know right. and that's that is also presenting its own challenges yeah um and and it's it's just restruct it's like now okay how do we restructure this how do we restructure a studio visit how do we restructure not being able to go into an archive at the moment, you know, travel to get there. And usually for me, it's being with people a lot, you know, in conversation, meeting with them. And now it's just switching over to now a Zoom kind of platform or, um, you know, thinking about the works maybe in a more intimate way too. And so I think Again, the other works I can speak to because, you know, it's in hindsight. And right now, like being in the middle of it, it's still the inner workings of something that I'm, you know, is changing shape and uh, taking a moment to kind of recalibre and shift a little bit. Um, but I think um, really having support from specific individuals to that I'm beyond thankful for because that kind of support um, that uh, that also gives me the encouragement and continues that little fire in the valley. Yeah, yeah. I I love how you I reference that with so many artists the hustle. I don't. <laughs> it's the only way to describe it. That it is a nonstop constant, and I think a little bit is a motivation but a lot of it can wear you down, but there, and that's why, you know, what is that fire that sustains the pursuit, that sustains the practice, um, even though life happens. And I venture to say for a lot of artists, um, you know, it's different. We all navigate it differently. And um, it's not, it's not for the faint of heart, you know, it's definitely, um, I think as you described, when it's great, it's so great. But sometimes when it's bad, it can feel really Oh. <laughs> so. And I think that's why my walking practice. <laughs> walking yeah, you, has saved my life. <laughs> yeah, you need something beyond that. But I am always, every time, and as I said before, I 
was going to talk to you, I was reading through our notes and I get really excited and I'm even more excited. Um, it was, it's just always wonderful to hear about your process and what you're working on. And, you know, I've talked a lot this year um, about this concept of unlearning what we've learned specifically for our children. Um, and that that's why those erased narratives are so important because they are quite empowering for those who are part of the communities who have experienced erase narratives. So I, I really, um, I really thank you for doing that work. And, and this year I've made it a point to thank everyone for their labor because we have an ex we have a really complicated history of labor in our country, as you alluded to, especially for those in the BIPOC community. So I really thank you for your work and I'm so excited to hear about what you do next. And as I told Vincent, we can't wait to have both of you back. Hostile Terrain doesn't open till February. We have lots of conversations to have, but um, we really hope to be able to um, just continue and find out more about what you're doing and what you're bringing to fruition next. Oh, I love that. It's always so nice to speak with you, Erica. You make it so, <laughs> such a, a wonderful, like, experience. Oh, I'm happy. I'm just an art nerd. That's all. No, and you pick up on the little nuances that are just on the details. You just, and. Well, I could say it right back to you. You make it super easy. The, these, um, I look forward to these, but there are some that I look forward to more than others. And this is definitely one of them. So look forward to hearing from us again. Thank you so much for your time, Adriana. And stay safe and be well. And um, yeah. We're going to talk very soon. Thank you so much. No, thank you.